I'd like to welcome you all to our latest Property Managers Breakfast Forum, um, the latest of which we are welcoming Steve Watts and Sean Alexander to our, to our morning session. We're going to be discussing um, capital allowances um, and the impacts across your business. Um, please, if you do have any questions, um, and I'm sure you'll have plenty as we go through, very happy to answer them. If you could use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, the questions will come through to our panel session um, and we'll come back to you um, accordingly. Okay, thank you very much. Over to Steve then. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, I'm Steve Watts. I'm a tax partner in BDO's real estate and construction team specialising in capital allowances. I'm pleased to be joined by Sean Alexander, a member of my team as well today. Sean and I are both charter surveyors and specialise in capital allowances. With our property backgrounds, we understand buildings and construction together with tax legislation and advise clients on maximising capital allowances available for property related expenditure. Uh, next slide, please. Over the last few years, there has been some major changes to the UK capital allowances rules. These have been the most significant changes since 2008 which saw the withdrawal of industrial buildings allowances and the introduction of two separate categories of plant and machinery allowances with different rates of writing down allowances for the first time. With property owners and occupiers currently reviewing their property portfolios and requirements, it is important to be aware of the tax allowances and incentives available. In this session today, we're going to provide a brief overview and update on capital allowances and in particular focus on structures and buildings allowance and other reliefs to enhance cash flow through tax savings and repayments and some of the practical implications to, to consider. And at the end we'll have some time for some question and answers so please post any questions and we'll come back to them at the end. Next slide please. Sir. So when, when are capital allowances relevant? Well capital allowances can provide substantial tax savings or repayments for property related expenditure and are relevant throughout the life cycle of a property. This can be in relation to the construction or fitting out of a new building, the alteration or refurbishment of an existing building and the acquisition and disposal of property. There are many factors that need to be considered in respect of any of these events from collation of the relevant information through to the considering of the timing of an expenditure or the prior ownership history of the property that can affect the allowances available. Without awareness of the allowances that are currently available, the benefit of capital allowances cannot be optimised or overlooked, or potentially even lost. Next slide, please. Sir. As a consequence of the impact of the C19 pandemic, all businesses are reviewing their property requirements. Initial impact has been short term minor adaptions which have been undertaken to achieve social distancing. But there's lots of talk about what the new norm will look like. Potential changes in working practices are resulting in property occupiers and owners now focusing on their longer term requirements in respect to their property needs. This may include the right locations, the type and amount of space required. How do you go about encouraging people back to the workplace or create collaborative workspaces? What facilities and environments are going to be required for, to support the well-being or provide physical space needed for, for occupants? Or are alternative property uses also need to be considered? There are many questions still to be resolved. And it's important to understand and consider capital allowances at the same time where it's likely that all businesses will be incurring some form of expenditure on their property. Next slide, please. Sue. In this table, we've summarised the main capital allowances and reliefs available for expenditure on commercial property and have highlighted how these, some of these allowances have changed over the recent years. Not all allowances and reliefs have changed, but in particular, some new allowances have either been introduced 
or rates have significantly increased. In particular, structures and buildings allowances have come in and we will go into this in, in quite some detail today, it will be one of the main focuses, focused, focused areas of our presentation. In addition, annual investment allowances have significantly increased and we'll come back to the implications of that later on. At the same time, certain allowances have been withdrawn or re rates reduced, and these are highlighted in this table in red. In particular, enhanced capital allowances, which were introduced uh, 10 years ago to encourage businesses to invest in energy saving plant machinery or environmentally beneficial plant machinery was withdrawn from April this year. These allowances had provided 100% first year allowance to encourage investment in these technologies and even provided a payable tax credit to businesses that were, were in loss situations. It's important to note that these allowances are still available for expenditures incurred prior to that date, but any expenditure after April this year, the allowance is no longer available. And so therefore, the types of assets that would have qualified for 100% first year allowance are now typically going to fall into the special rate pool plant machinery category, which the rate has reduced from, from last year down to 6%. So rather than providing the year one deduction, the relief is now available over, over many years, um, potentially most of the, the relief being provided over 35 years. So it's important to be aware of what the reliefs are available, what periods they, they, they relate to, and how to obtain the most beneficial rates of allowances available. As I mentioned, one of the biggest changes is the, in relation to the structures and building allowance. And I'm now going to hand over to Sean, who's going to talk through this in detail and cover some of the practical points to consider when considering structures and buildings allowances. Great, thanks, Steve. Um, so yeah, uh, structures and buildings allowance is a new form of allowance um, that was introduced in 2018, actually two years to the day. Um, what it means, it's a new form of allowance and it means that for the first time claims on building fabric are now possible. So there have been allowances historically where allowances on building fabric were uh, available, but this was really for certain assets, uh, asset classes like hotels and industrial buildings, and these were abolished around a decade ago. Um, so really for the past decade, cap allowances claims have had the idea um, and they've been commonly split between qualifying, that's expenditure on plant machinery, um, so in a typical building, air conditioning, lighting, fire alarms and lifts, and an eligible, so land and the building fabrics itself. So what SBA does in its introduction to the regime, it means that pretty much all of the expenditure on a typical building or a structure will now qualify for capital allowances. And it's more a question of which type of capital allowance will apply. Uh, this slide just gives a quick timeline um, of SBA. So it all started with the Office of Tax Simplification, which is a branch of HMRC. The OTS did a review into capital allowances, really to look into simplifying it. And they recommended a number of measures. Uh, and one of the measures was introducing a capital allowance for buildings and structures. Um, the idea to simplify the regime, but also make the UK system of capital allowances or tax depreciation more competitive when compared to other jurisdictions. Because um, in Europe and around the world, they have tax reliefs available for expenditure on buildings, whereas the UK historically haven't for most commercial properties. Um, so the OTS review was published in June 2018, and then the SBA being announced was rather surprising and very imminent. So it happened in budget 2018, two years ago, uh, October 2018. Um, and it was announced and it was immediately available from the 29th of October 2018. And we didn't actually see the legislation. Um, there was a period of consultation, but we didn't see the legislation then until the next summer. Great, thanks. Sue. Next slide, please. Um, so an overview of what SBA is. So it's announced on buildings and structures. Um, there's no strict definition of these terms. Um, they take their everyday meaning. In a typical building, the elements that will qualify for SBAs are things like the foundation systems, walls, windows, doors, ceiling, roof, staircases. So for new construction projects, these elements of the building would typically be the most expensive part of the project compared to the plant and machinery. Um, and this would have previously been all 
all ineligible for gap analysis purposes. So it can make a big difference. Uh, SBA can be claimed on any type of construction project where expenditures are being incurred. Not all property types, but pretty much every type of construction project. So new builds, redevelopments, conversions, refurbishments, fit outs. And it's also available for freeholders and leaseholders alike. It can also be available for not only when you're spending money um, on a building, on a, on a project, but also for acquisitions. Uh, but they're slightly more complex and there's different forms of methodologies and basis for these, which I'm going to come back to shortly. Um, as with anything with cash allowances and tax, there are conditions and the devil is in the detail with these sorts of things. Um, so it is only for, like other, uh, other capital allowances, it is only available for non-residential buildings. Um, so it doesn't include houses, flat complexes, student accommodations, and other buildings with dwellings don't qualify as well. That doesn't include hotels and care homes, however. Also, like other forms of capital allowance, there still is no um, form of relief for land acquisition costs or land remediation works or um, landscaping as well. But anything else in terms of the building or structure um, can qualify. Uniquely as well, it can be claimed on both UK and overseas buildings if the claimant is a UK taxpayer. There is also a big emphasis and a big requirement on evidence. And I'll cover this in the next slide of why evidence is so important with SBA. Another big consideration is timing. Um, with SBA, uh, it's only available where the contracts are entered into on or after the 29th of October 2018. And the type of contracts we're talking about is physical works in the course of construction, so spade in the ground type of things. We're not talking Arctic fees, professional fees. Big thing on timing as well is SBA is only available when a building is brought into use. So for a typical property investor, this is when the building is let, whereas for an occupier, it's actually when they start using their space that they've let. So how is SBA claimed? SBA expenditure, like other capital allowances, is pooled, uh, and then it's claimed straight line. But uniquely with SBA, uh, it's not pooled within one central pool. You need to create a SBA pool for each and every property and each and every project that SBA is claimed on. Originally, when it was first announced, it was meant to be 2% over 50 years. But from April 2020, this has been increased to 3% just over 33 years. Uh, how it interacts with the current regime is it slots quite nicely into the cash allowances legislation. As I said, there was the idea of ineligible and eligible. Uh, for the past decade, as in plant and machinery and an eligible on building. So it slots in quite nicely. You can't claim plant and machinery as SBA and you can't claim buildings or structures under plant and machinery um, allowances. But it is maybe questionable this provides any simplicity, as was the OTS original, as they were looking out for um, originally with this, with this uh, form of allowance. Because really the regime is pretty much unchanged apart from the new SBA allowance coming in. Uh, and a big caveat to SBA as well, and this is where it massively differs from other form of capital analysis, is that it interacts with capital gains tax, whether there's a gain uh, or a loss realised. So if you claim SBA, it will be clawed back uh, as is, as the allowances is, when a property is sold for a profit or a gain. So really, it's really a timing difference for most freeholder investors. It's a slightly different story for operational leaseholders, and we've got a case study um, coming up, which will demonstrate that. Thanks, Sue. Next slide. So on to the um, practical considerations. Um, I mean, in terms of is a project eligible for SBA, as I said earlier, there's a big emphasis on evidence uh, and there's a big emphasis on timing. So in terms of whether a project is eligible, has the contract been entered into on or after the 29th of October 2018? Is the expenditure on a non-residential building or structure? You know, and then also consider, is it on a construction project where an SBA claim is relatively easy or is it on an acquisition? Because if it is on an acquisition, the basis of claiming is slightly different, which I'll go through in the next slide. So the evidence requirements, they are extremely important um, in all forms of capital allowances, but especially SBA. So it's very important that all contracts, all correspondence and all invoices really with the project team and contractors and suppliers are kept. And the reason that is, is because there's a requirement known as the allowance statement requirement. It's relatively simple. An allowance statement is a physical document. It's relatively simple to prepare. 
all you need is the right information that is retained and available. Uh, it has to contain the identity of the building, the date of the earliest written contract, so making sure that it's on or after the 29th of October 2018, the amount of SBA, the qualifying expenditure that's been incurred on the construction or the acquisition, and the date that it's actually been brought into qualifying non-residential use. So the information should be readily available if all contracts and all correspondence are retained. The reason the allowance statement is so important is, is if, if this is not down, the allowance statement, there is no SBA for the current taxpayer who's looking to claim. But perhaps more importantly, when they look to sell the property in the future, there'll be no SBA for future buyers if they can't inherit the allowance statement. So the allowance statement has to be done. It has to be retained on file. It doesn't, it isn't statutory to file it. Um, it has to be retained on file just in case HMRC asks for it as part of an inquiry. Um, but more importantly, it has to be passed on to future buyers for them to inherit SBAs, otherwise they get nil. We talked about the timing requirements as well. So the idea of inter-use dates. It's again, very important this is evidenced and this is documented because SBA is first available when a building or structure is brought into use. If a building is brought into use part way for a year, there's an adjustment to the first year claim. So effectively, the days that the building are not in use are deducted. And a similar calculation is needed where SBA was eligible for 2%. So expenditure was incurred before April 2020. And then more expenditure is incurred after April 2020. And 3% is available. I think a big thing with SBA is um, understanding and considering whether it's right for you. The status quo of cap allowances still exists. Um, so segregation is probably more important than it ever has been. In order to claim the maximum amount of tax relief and the maximum amount of cap allowances, valuations and segregation are still needed. It isn't simple capital allowances. SBA isn't the answer to everything where all expenditure can just be bunged in one pool and claimed at a reduced rate. You have to do a segregation exercise. You can't claim plant machinery as SBA and vice versa. And I think a big consideration as well is interact with CGT. Ultimately, at the moment, as is, this is a cash flow benefit that's going to be clawed if it's likely that the asset is going to be sold for a gain. However, the claim is also important to consider for future sales because if it's not identified and claimed and the allowance statement's not completed, future buyers will get nothing. Thanks, Sue. So I talked about earlier how about there's different different basis of claiming on acquisitions. With construction, it's fairly simple. If you've carried out a project and you meet the requirements of SBA, you can claim the SBA qualifying expenditure. For acquisitions, it's different, and it all depends on who the vendor is and whether the building is being bought, used, or unused. So the kind of the spectrum of it. If an unused building is being bought from a developer, the claim is completely unrestricted and it's calculated on the purchase price that's being paid. But if it's bought used from an investor owner, your claim as a buyer will completely depend on whether they've claimed and whether they've done the allowance statement. And if they haven't, um, and the building would have been able to claim for SBAs, there's no SBA to inherit. So I think a big thing if you're acquiring a building to understand is, SBA is actually now part of the commercial property standard inquiries or the CPSEs, which most commercial property solicitors will use. So this is going to come up on transactions, both from a buyer and seller's point. I think it's very important to consider it early. If a building is being acquired and it could have qualified for SBA and it was built after the SBA rules came in, a claim could be possible. But it's very important to understand on what basis and if it's needed, you get all the information early and you get the, potentially the allowance statement from the seller as well. Thanks, see you next slide. So we just wanted to give you a quick example of this life cycle of a property, a very simple property. And I mentioned earlier the need for an SBA pool for each and every property and each and every project. And this gives a quick idea of the look, uh, what that will look like over the ownership of a property from construction to disposal. So if you say a building is built in 2020 and everything meets the requirements, then SBA will be available when the building is brought into use and it will be claimed over 33 years to 2053. And at this point, the constructor who's looking to claim would make an allowance statement or draw up an allowance statement. And then say in 2025, an extension is completed, the SBA on the extension will be pulled separately from that original SBA pool and then claimed separately from the original build. 
This similarly will be available over 33 years, but this pool will go to 2058. Now, an important note is the allowance statement that was already prepared can just be updated. There doesn't need to be a separate allowance statement for each project, as long as the property is the same. So then in 2030, let's say the building is sold, well, the seller can pass the allowances to the buyer and the, both them SBA pools will move across to the buyer to continue to be claimed until 2053 and 2058 respectively. And then if that buyer then incurs additional expenditure, they'll just continue more SBA pools, create more SBA pools, add to the allowance statement and so on. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to go through some case studies as well with SBA. So I think this is a good example of how big a difference SBA can make, particularly on bigger projects. Um, so this is an ongoing project for us with a client that's um, carrying out an £80 million redevelopment of an office building in London. So far, we've done some valuation work for them. And roughly 28.5 million of plant machinery allowances will be available and 37.5 of structures and buildings allowance. The important thing to note is this 37 in a million, uh, 37.5 million, wouldn't have previously qualified for any form of allowance. Um, so the SBA provides over 33 years, just over seven million pounds of tax relief. And then what this also does, if the property is going to be sold, it offers future buyers this tax relief. Thanks, Sue. I uh, also wanted to give a quick example of a smaller project where SBA could also come up and why it's important for occupiers to consider it as well. Um, so this is a smaller fit out we've recently completed for an occupier um, that has a short lease of two um, office floors. Um, so roughly 1.4 million of plant machinery was identified and uh, fairly modest SBAs of 270,000. But you have to remember again, this 270,000 wouldn't have qualified for any form of relief. And the work that we've completed is actually for an LLP. So they have a higher income tax rate uh, rather than corporation tax. So this offers tax saving of around 120,000. And again, this wouldn't have been available previously because it wouldn't have qualified for anything under cap allowances apart from SBA. The good thing with this is, is there'll be no clawback for occupiers under capital gains because it's an occupational lease. They're not gonna sell the occupational lease for a gain. So the SBA will just stop when the lease ends or if the lease is extended, the SBA will continue to be available. So that's a fairly quick run through of SBA. Uh, I hope we've highlighted the challenges that the new allowances brings, but also the opportunities um, and what needs to be considered by both investors and occupiers with this new relief. So I'll pass back to Steve now to talk about annual investment allowance and lease incentives. Thank you, Sean. Um, yes, it's going to pick up on a couple of the other areas to consider. Firstly, in relation to annual investment allowances, which we've seen some changes um, in the rates during the last few years, and uh, we're expecting another change at the end of this calendar year. Um, just as background, the purpose of annual investment allowances was to stimulate business investment by providing an increased incentive to invest in plant machinery. And following the, the initial introduction of annual investment allowance, we saw a number of years where the rate was constantly changing. And, and that was until the budget in 2015, when the annual investment was said to be permanently set at £200,000 per annum from 1 January 2016. That didn't really last very long. And, and, and really, as a consequence of the impact of Brexit um, and the, the impact that was having on the economy, the government decided to introduce a temporary increase uh, in the rate of annual investment allowance of one million pounds per annum for the periods 1 January 2019 to 31 December 2020. And what this, uh, what this enhanced allowance would, would enable businesses to do is to write off any expenditure on plant and machinery up to the annual limit in the year in which expenditure is incurred. So it's important that um, companies would look to allocate the annual investment allowance in the most beneficial way. And that's typically to offset against the, the, the slower depreciating rate assets, such as assets that would generally qualify in the special rate pool at the current 6%. We are rapidly approaching the end of this temporary increase. And there's been no formal announcement from the government yet as to whether there'll be an extension to this temporary increase. 
the budget, um, the, the autumn budget that was expected to be, be an announcement was postponed to focus on issues around uh, the, the, the pandemic and supporting businesses in that way. Um, but there were some rumours at the time that Chancellor may have been considering to have no annual investment al limit, allowing all expenditure on plant and machinery to be fully written off for a period of time. However, this does not materialised, and therefore the annual investment allowance is likely to revert back to the permanent level of 200,000 per annum from the end of this calendar year. Next slide, please, Sue. Where a company has a 31 December year end, it's, it's relatively straightforward to work out what the annual investment allowance available for that period is. But where a company has a, 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 a financial year that doesn't fall in line with the calendar year, it is necessary to calculate what the annual investment allowance for the, for the period would be. And this is, this is done by looking at the, the dates of the annual investment allowance in relation to the financial year. So in, the, in this example, we have a company that has a 30 June year end, and therefore for the year ended 31 June, 20, sorry, 30 June 2021, the annual investment allowance for that year would be calculated as 600,000 pounds in, in total, comprising 500,000 for the six month period up to 31 December 2020, and then a further 100,000 in relation to the six months for the, for the first six months of the following year. So although there's, there's an annual investment allowance available of 600,000 for the year, another factor to consider is actually the timing of the expenditure. So if 500,000 is incurred on plant machinery up to 31 December, then that can all be offset against the annual investment allowance and a further 100,000 could be incurred in the following period. However, if no expenditure on plant machinery was incurred up to 31 December 2020 and the full 600,000 was incurred in the first six months of the, of the following year, then the annual investment allowance would be restricted to £100,000 only and 500,000 would therefore fall into the normal writing down allowances at their respective rates. So it's very important to consider the timing of expenditure in relation to annual investment allowances. Um, there's a very short period of window left that, um, you know, if there's any in, in, in expenditure to be incurred before that date, then it's important in, it's incurred in, in the current calendar year. Next slide, please, sir. Lease incentives and inducements is, is an important area not to overlook as well, because the tax implications of providing or receiving incentives or an inducement to enter into lease of land can have tax consequences. These can take a number of different forms, such as a rent-free period, lease inducements, or a form of capital contribution. And where, a payment, where an inducement involves the payment of cash or the assumption of an existing liability in association with the grant of an interest in land, then this can be considered a reverse premium and taxable as a receipt on the recipient. However, where a payment is a capital contribution towards works to a property, there's also an interaction with the capital allowances rules that needs to be considered. This is in respect of both the, the contributor, typically a landlord, who will be entitled to claim capital allowances in respect of the contribution that's paid to the tenant. And also secondly, in relation to the recipient, the tenant, who will have to deduct the contribution received from the capital allowances available. It's often common practice to include some form of allocation of this contribution within an, an agreement to lease. But with the changes to capital allowances available, it is now necessary to consider what the most beneficial allocation is being made and what the tax consequences of the allocation are. Particularly now with the, the introduction of structures and buildings allowances, which brings in additional relief. Next slide, please, Tim. So in summary, we've provided an overview and update to the main capital allowances available and some of the practical complexities that, ne complexities that need to be considered. With property and owners and occupiers potentially reviewing their properties and portfolios and making alterations or adaptions to existing properties, relocating premises 
disposing or looking at alternative uses, it is important to bear in mind the capital allowance available and the potential cash flow and tax savings that need to be considered, both in terms of current projects or projects that had previously been carried out. So thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, please post them now and we'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Um, got a couple of questions come in. Um, first question is in relation to structures and buildings allowance. So the question is, if a property is pre-let, would that be the date to use for first brought into non-residential use for structures and buildings allowances purposes? Sean, would you like to? Thanks for passing that across, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, so use for a property business, um, so aware of property might be pre-let. Um, so use for a property uh, business, a building is brought into use um, when that taxpayer um, is able, under the terms of a lease, um, can gather rents. And so it's more about the lease when that's signed. So I think if a property is pre-let, um, that could be seen as the date that it's first brought into use under the legislation. Um, the difficulty is, is that um, SBA is available when expenditure is incurred, but also when a building is brought into use. So you're going to have these pockets, especially if it's a long, um, a long project and you know, um, over a, a long period of time, you're going to have pocket, pockets of expenditure that will qualify um, in separate SBA pools. So the main consideration where a property is pre-let and then it's going to be a long project. Um, will be to make sure that simplicity is there. So an allowance statement is done. Um, and then under the legislation, there are simplicity um, parts of the legislation that allow you to roll over SBA pools so you don't have to keep creating them um, throughout time. Um, so it's important that it's considered um, to make sure that the simplicity factor is there. Um, there's another question on SBA as well um, around occupiers requiring an allowance statement. Um, or whether they do. So yes, SBA allowance statements are very important for if you're going to dispose of the property and pass them across. But equally, they're very important if you want to claim in the first place. So they're not statutory to submit, but they're statutory to have if you're looking to claim. Um, and the legislation sets out that if you don't do the allowance statement requirement before you make the claim, then the SBA claim is nil. So without doing the SBA statement and having it on file in case HMRC asks any questions at all, um, HMRC could look to restrict the SBA claim that you're making to nil if you don't have it. So best practice and by the legislation is that occupiers need it as well, even if they're not looking to sell the property in the future. One other question which um, it relates to uh, someone who incurred expenditure on a property five years ago and have not claimed any capital allowances uh, at all um, in relation to a, um, a fitting out of a, of a property. Have they lost uh, entitlement to claim capital allowances or what, what capital allowances could be claimed? Um, in terms of capital allowances, you, you do not lose the, the right to claim capital allowances providing you still own the asset and the uh, the items in which expenditure was was incurred. Um, so, is it still possible to make a claim for for the expenditure that was incurred? It's just not possible to go back um, potentially five years to make that claim. So, it's it, the claim could be made in the earliest or the, the, the latest tax computation that can be a uh, claim could be made. So it could be the current year or by going back and making an amendment to an earlier year and bringing the qualifying expenditure in for that year. Obviously, in terms of, uh, as, as we covered, the, 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 uh, from when the, the date when the expenditure was incurred, structures and buildings allowances wouldn't be available. So the, the capital allowances that are likely to be available would be in relation to any expenditure on plant machinery that form part of that fitting out works. So that would include any main pool plant machinery or special rate pool plant machinery for uh, expenditure on the longer life assets uh, or integral features to a building. Um, 
Um, I've got one, one further question, um, which um, is in relation to a capital contribution um, that was, was provided and this was pre, pre structures and buildings allowances being introduced. So what, what would be the tax implications of that? Um, in terms of, as, as, as I mentioned, where a capital contribution is made, this is considered to be a, re a reverse premium. So it can be uh, a taxable as a receipt in the recipient's hands. Um, where expenditure reduces the recipient's ability to claim capital allowances, then that would mean that the, the amount is not taxable. However, any expenditure that was received that wasn't, wouldn't be eligible for capital allowances. So as, as Sean had mentioned, prior to the SBA rules coming in, quite a lot of the expenditure was, was, was ineligible. Then that proportion of contribution received would be taxable as a receipt um, in the hands of the recipient and taxed as income over the period of the lease. Got another question that's popped up. Um, in reference to a life cycle event in an occupied building, which would typically be a service charge item, would any cap capital expenditure allowance be available for landlord funding? Um, it'd be important to consider the, um, the accounting treatment of, of the um, service charge amount. Um, Because it would it depend on the nature of the, whether the expenditure is capital expenditure um, or is this being is this being funded by, through the service charge and therefore being met by by other parties so it's not a it's not a straightforward question um, we need to sort of consider that one a little bit further is then John do you have any comments on that question so yeah, no, I suppose, yeah, I agree that, yeah, you'd have to consider whether it was RevEx being met or whether it was CapEx. Um, another thing, I think, if it is landlord funding and it is CapEx, capital allowances could be considered um, under contribution allowances. But as Steve said, you'd have to consider the accounting treatment, whether it's definitely RevEx or CapEx. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit of a <laughs> little bit of a complex question to go over in a, a morning briefing. Um, but yeah, no, certainly it could be considered. Okay, um, I don't think we have any further questions. So if there's no further questions, then I think we close the WebEx, uh, the, um, the session today. And thank you very much for, for joining. Um, if you do have any other further questions, then please feel free to get in touch. And thank you for joining us today.